Right from the, the dials and the motion works, all of the, the uh, little universal joints that, that uh, operate the dials and the hands and the movement itself have all been totally restored. So now we're putting it back together again and um, hopefully it'll be here for another 100 years. I'm Paul Fournier. I'm with the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors and we teamed up to restore the movement in this Seth Thomas post clock. The clock mechanism was done at my shop in Scarborough. Uh, it's completely disassembled, clean, polished, repainted, several bushings. Um, and it's, uh, it's been running great now for over a month. Today we're installing it in the restored case and it should be fine to run for many decades. Overall, the most challenging part was the case because it was in such bad condition. We were really lucky with the movement that all of the parts still existed, even though it had been converted to a motor-driven movement. Everything existed that we could convert it back to a weight-driven, mechanized movement. The movement is on a uh, six-hour automatic rewind to wind the weights up so we don't have to do any you know, regular winding or other maintenance to it. Hi, this is Mary Kay Munsey. I'm a resident of Bram Hall uh, condominiums. Uh, majority of the residents who live in Bram Hall Road contributed to it, so we're now thrilled that it's back and it's our landmark and it's a place that we know we can turn into um, our area and it points us out as a special location. We'd like to acknowledge the tremendous contribution of time and talent made by Maine Chapter 89 of the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors for their meticulous restoration of this beautiful clock. And also to Jonathan Taggart of Taggart Objects for all of his craftsmanship in restoring this 1,800 pound wrought iron case and all of its ornamentation. And we'd like to thank Mike Hebert of Hebert Construction for providing a strong new foundation for the clock on this spot. And we'd like to thank Greater Portland Landmarks and the historic preservation staff of the city of Portland for their inspiration and their guidance on this project. It's really so amazing and so beautiful and historic artifacts like this, we know are especially vulnerable to loss because of neglect, deferred maintenance or removal for resale, which makes this Portland clocks painstaking restoration all the more remarkable. I don't live too far from where this clock is located and I often walk that stretch of Congress Street and it really has um, enlivened the area and it's so beautiful and what used to be kind of in your peripheral vision is now something you really focus on. So I think it's really, really exciting and I just wanna say thank you. And I also just wanna be able to say thank you to the city's historic preservation staff who worked closely with the building owners on the clock restoration project. Um, it's these kind of saves that are due in large part um, because the city adopted a preservation program to ensure that important elements of our past are protected and celebrated. This project would not be possible without the generous financial contribution from many. I'd like to thank the owners of the Francis, Nate Deloyce, Tony Deloyce, and Jeff Harder, and also acknowledge the generous contributions of the neighbors here at Bram Hall Row, with special thanks to Peter Muncy. And I'd also like to thank the partners of Bram Hall Row LLC and Center West LLC for not only contributing to this clock restoration project, but also for their investments in this section of Upper Congress Street. Well, we're back. We hope that you enjoyed that little look at the story of the restoration of the clock and hear from some of the specialists and experts and uh, engaged community members that made this project possible. It's been so much fun to work on over these past several years. So we're really glad that you're a part of it with us now. Um, I would like to say a special thank you to Mayor Kate Snyder for uh, joining in with her kind words this morning and a special shout out to Joshua Gates of Avenue Media for producing not only today's event, but this uh, terrific video uh, that will be part of our archive. And speaking of archives, we, all of us have collected hundreds of photographs 
of the clock before restoration, during restoration, and now in its beautiful new condition. So um, if anybody has any questions about the process or might like to share in some of those uh, images uh, to learn more about the project, we'll uh, make that possible for you. So um, those are um, part of the history of maybe the next 100 years of uh, the clock's story. So now uh, we once again encourage you to uh, send in your comments and uh, ask questions by way of Facebook or YouTube. And uh, we're gonna have an informal discussion. I, I maybe start things off uh, in our conversation. Um, I'll pick on Sarah, uh, Sarah Hansen, again, uh, Executive Director of Greater Portland Landmarks. And Sarah, um, in 2017, Greater Portland Landmarks placed the Hay and Peabody clock on its list of places in peril. So um, can you tell us, you know, what does Landmarks hope happens when a place, or in this case, an object, uh, get put on that list of places in peril. What do you hope happens at that point? Sure, thanks, David. Um, delighted to be here today. This is a very fun, uh, fun thing to celebrate. So, um, so the Places in Peril list was started in uh, 2012. And the goal of the list is to bring uh, awareness and attention to different um, historic buildings, places, sites, structures, objects, um, and what those threats are um, that are facing them. And then hopefully, um, you know, educate people, raise awareness and get, um, get uh, resources allocated so that we can work towards whatever a save looks like for that particular um, issue or challenge. So, um, so when we placed this um, on the list in 2017, uh, the hope was obviously to rally people around um, this clock, recognize its importance in Portland and what a great um, catalyst the restoration of this could be um, for the rest of the neighborhood, along with the, of course, the amazing um, work uh, at the Francis Hotel. So um, I think we, this is a very, very um, delightful thing to say that, that, uh, that it's saved now. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, um, we'll um, come back to you in a few minutes, but uh, sure. maybe think about some other um, uh, places in peril in the Portland area that uh, you might want to mention. Uh, I'll come back and let you think about that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Don't want to put There's you on a list. the list. <laughs> uh, um, maybe I'll ask Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, you probably have one of the more interesting businesses that I've ever come across. Uh, curious about um, the kinds of things that you might typically restore if there's such a thing as typical and um, whether or not this has been a typical restoration project for you. Well, Jonathan I, Taggart of Taggart Objects Conservation, by the way. I would like to thank you again for putting on this uh, presentation and it's been a pleasure to work with everyone on uh, this project. Um, this project is both typical and not typical of the work I do. Um, most of the projects I work on are unique. And that's what makes it typical, is that um, I will never work probably on another clock like this. Um, I've worked on the restoration of the Lincoln Park Fountain, which again is unique. Uh, what is typical is that the actual treatment process and the methods and materials are uh, pretty similar to what I work on on a regular basis. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, um, it, it sounds like um, uh, most everything is not typical, but there are some things that they have in common. Uh, like a lot of the work you do is on iron and metal and very heavy objects, is that correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, technically an objects conservator, but I mostly work on outdoor sculpture. A lot of cast iron like this, uh, a lot of bronze, um, you know, some wooden objects like totem poles and. Um, but that's, you know, a whole different range of, uh, of treatment. Um, I like when in, in the video you said the clock was in terrible condition. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. <laughs> that's, a, that's a total truth. I mean, the thing that I found most shocking in taking it apart is you have to understand that that globe, that ball on top probably weighs more than a thousand pounds all by itself. And it goes down to that little tiny base. And, what holds that whole thing up is a, a 
pair of structures. One of them is the individual cast sections bolted together, in some cases with very small screws. And then in the center, there's a, a large structural pipe that bolts the whole thing together. And the, in the combination, the, they were both failing, is that some of the screws that held the ball in place, some of them were completely missing or corroded down to only a small little neck. Hmm. Plus the big bolt itself was corroded to a very thin area in the bottom. Plus the, the foundation had, had shifted so the clock was tilted at an angle. So the potential of it actually collapsing was really great. So when I say terrible, I meant terrible. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, we, we all see the outside of this big cast iron case, but there's an awful lot that goes on inside. And that's primarily where Tim and all his colleagues uh, came into the picture. Um, Tim, um, you know, I don't think I had ever heard of an organization called the National Association and wa of uh, Watch and Clock Collectors. Now, um, that sounds like, you know, kind of a passive uh, organization, but you guys are nothing but uh, nothing like passive. Uh, you got very involved and uh, worked on this project for several years. Um, tell us a little bit first, what is the NAWCC? How many main members are there in the chapter? And, uh, you know, why did you take on this project? Um, sure, David. Um, a couple of things. Yeah, we're, we're not as well publicized as the NFL, for sure. But uh, <laughs> we, we may get there someday. Um, I, I also want to echo Jonathan's comments first. Just great video. That's the first time I've seen that and uh, really nicely done. Uh, and, and kudos to all the people that have been involved in this project. It's been a great project. Um, I have to uh, tell Sarah that the Places in Peril program works in this case. Um, that's how we became aware of the project. Uh, we saw, I think, uh, I think we saw it in the paper advertised. And um, being a clock club, one that loves, our members love timepieces, you know, we thought this would be a really great opportunity to get involved. So it works, Sarah. Um, the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors is, is just that. It's, it's a national group of people that are interested and, and really love sort of addicted to uh, clocks. Mm -hmm. And you'll find all their members have tons of clocks in their collection. So um, we really, uh, appreciate clocks and you know we want to see them re uh, kept alive uh, there's so many great timepieces out there um, our each uh, each being a national organization it's organized by local chapters and, and almost every state or many states have their own chapter and we have one in maine chapter 89 uh, about 40 or 50 members in the chapter and um, we got together and, and decided, a small team of us, that, hey, this would be a great project for our chapter to get involved in. And so um, there are about eight or nine really dedicated individuals. And if this were, you know, different times, I could probably bring them all up and, and announce them. But um, these people were really dedicated. And they were there for, uh, you know, disassembling the clock, uh, doing a ton of work on the insides of the clock down at Paul's shop and elsewhere and then uh, reinstalling it. So it's, it's just been a great thing for our chapter. Um, and, you know, we really appreciate it. And as in the video, it was remarked, people would just stop by on the, on the sidewalk and really appreciate the clock. So it's gonna be enjoyed by many, many people. So we're, we're happy to be a part of that. That's awesome. <clears throat> and again, I didn't reintroduce Tim Von Ryan, uh, current president of the main chapter 89. Um, also, I want to remind uh, our audience out there in the world, uh, please um, uh, take a moment to send a question or a comment in by Facebook or YouTube. We'll be um, fielding those as they come along. And um, I wanted to, uh, speaking of the involvement of chapter 89 and um, tapping into an amazing amount of expertise that resides right here in Maine. Uh, it, it's quite remarkable the specialists and experiences members have. Um, but Nate, um, Nate Deloise, uh, I'll turn to you. You you took the initiative several years ago mm -hmm. to reach out to uh, clock experts, uh, not only around Maine but New England and all across the country, uh, based on networking, um, to get quotes. We didn't know about Chapter Eighty Nine at that time, and uh, you went out to get bids or quotes on a total restoration of the clock. 
Um, and you've got some pretty shocking uh, budgetary numbers. Uh, so can you just talk about that process and then how um, the team came about uh, doing this with um, a different approach for a lot less money? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, David. So when we started this project back in 2015, 2016, there were a few things that were pretty clear. Um, one was that we needed to find experts that knew about the clock. Um, you know, for as little as I knew about the hotel business when we started building the Francis, I knew even less about clocks. Um, I mean, we didn't even know who to call. Um, another thing that was really clear was how important it was for the community members. Um, you know, we're doing this work at the Francis, and, you know, as soon as construction started, and we'd be standing outside, you know, having a meeting, um, people would be walking by on the street, all they wanted to talk about was the clock. They didn't care what we were doing to the building. <laughs> they just wanted to know when was the clock going to get fixed, when was it going to start to work again. Um, so we knew it was an important project. Um, so I think we started calling um, experts just by, you know, the old fact, the new fashion way we Googled, um, called some people who we didn't know, um, got some, um, some estimates that were really all over the board. Um, we actually had some people call us um, because they had read about the project in, in the paper. Um, and, you know, we had estimates that went up to $120,000, $150,000 for the, for the entire, you know, to, for the entire restoration. Um, I mean, one guy, <laughs> we, we got one quote from somebody for about $120,000, he sent it, and then he called me and said, you know, but I don't really want to do it because I don't really know how to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, all right, well, we can throw that one out. So, so <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. We needed to find people who did, um, you know, probably, not probably, but I mean, the most important call that we made uh, was to Greater Portland Landmarks, um, where we basically cleaned clean and said, you know, we, we have no idea what we're doing. We need some help. Um, and so, you know, we met with Sarah and her predecessor um, probably back in 2016, 2017, um, you know, told them what we wanted to do. Um, and we started to put together a plan. I think the first step of the plan was getting put on the places in peril. Um, and then through that, as Tim mentioned, we were introduced to Harry Hepburn and, and Tim. Um, and they really brought so much expertise to the table uh, and generosity. They knew that, uh, you know, our budget was um, pretty tight. You know, the Francis was just in its first year of operation. It's a very small business. It's a 15-room hotel. Um, so, you know, you know, we didn't have $150,000 to put towards, a, you know, a, a major renovation like this. Um, so, you know, they really were very generous in working with us in donating their time um, to, um, you know, to do the work that, that, that they did. And then um, I think they introduced us to Jonathan. Uh, truthfully, you can stop me if I'm wrong. I, I can't quite remember how we were introduced to Jonathan, but it was clear from our first meeting with Jonathan that he was the right guy to be talking about, talking to um, about, you know, doing the, the entire, the, the structure. Um, and, you know, he understood that that budget was tight and, you know, his, uh, you know, his, his estimate for work certainly reflected that. And, you know, later in the project, after the, the clock came down about a year ago um, and went up to, you know, the, the, the structure went up to Jonathan's to, to be worked on, um, you know, as we got closer to the reinstallation date, there were still other costs that we, you know, needed to, to figure out. Uh, uh, you know, a, a new foundation for the for the clock, uh, electrical for the clock, you know, all these costs end up really adding up. So, um, you know, that's, we were lucky enough to be working with Mike Hebert and Hebert Construction on another project. And we just told him about the clock and he donated his time. I mean, Mike was there digging a hole, uh, you know, to, to do some of the foundation work. It, it was, it was amazing, their generosity. Um, to really get us over the hump to this final stage of, of uh, you know, being able to install it. Um, so, you know, all in with everybody's support, with the support of the Bram Hall Row residents um, who chipped in uh, to help get it done. I mean, we, we got it done, I would say for, I mean, less than half of probably the average estimate that we got back in 2017. Um, so, you know, we are, it, it probably took a little longer <laughs> because we are trying to get all the pieces together ourselves, which is, you know, which was, uh, you know, a little bit out of our comfort zone, but, you know, once we really turned things over to Tim and, and Harry and the guys at the, the, the watch and clock collectors, um, and then Jonathan as well, I mean, you know, they, they took it from there. Pretty That's awesome great. job that they did. It's amazing too, thinking about, you know, the way the clock looked and, 
<laughs> once the Francis was, the construction was done and the Francis looked really beautiful, the clock really stood out. I mean, it stood out before, but it really stood out as, whoa, what are they doing with that clock? And so that first year of operation was tough because people would come and, and check in and almost always the first question would be, when are you guys going to do that clock? <laughs> you know, it just doesn't, it, it wasn't looking right. And to even in our, I mean, at least personally, I couldn't imagine it coming out the way that it did. I mean, it's the work that these guys did is so amazing. It looks better than, than, than I could have ever imagined. I mean, really kudos to, to the guys who did the work. That's great, Nate. Thanks so much uh, for giving us a recap of that. <clears throat> and um, you mentioned um, when um, you got the uh, restoration of the Mellon Bolster House, also known as the Hay and Peabody Building, uh, accomplished. That really made a contrast between um, the beautiful restoration of the building <clears throat> and the um, the place in peril out front, which was the clock. Uh, and um, that brings me to Tony. Um, and, and by the way, um, while uh, we um, continue our conversation, we're getting some good questions in from Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. So I wanna encourage uh, folks out there to get those in. We're gonna turn to those comments and questions in just a moment. But um, I wanted to ask Tony Deloise, one of the owners of the Francis, um, it, you said in the video that this project really started for you in 2015 when um, you and your partners were able to place the um, Mellon Bolster House on the National Register of Historic Places <clears throat> and then began the restoration of that beautiful building. So I just want to ask you, um, what's it been like to start up a boutique hotel in a historic building and then what does the restoration of the clock mean to you and the guests and uh, maybe how you talk about the hotel okay um well uh, i think you know starting the boutique hotel um you, you talk about uniqueness um you know we're in the, the western part of, of the peninsula there's not a lot of hotels around here so just by nature um we're creating a little bit of a unique property, 15 rooms. It's a historic renovation. Everything's a little bit different on the inside, um, which which just lends to a really good story. It, it allows us to talk about each individual room or 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 piece of the hotel as, as something unique to itself, even not only within Portland, but also within the hotel, um, whether it's the historic floors in one of the rooms or or the, the framing of the doors. Um, you know, we really enjoy telling that story I and mean, we're, we have completed our third year and I just gave a tour, you know, a week ago and it, it never gets old, you know, being able to show, uh, you know, some of the amazing craftsmanship that took place back in the 1880s to, to construct this building. And um, the reason why I said this, it started back, uh, you know, five years ago is when you, you know, my brother and I were standing at Tandem across the street and looking at the building and, you know, as he said, you know, you see this big, you know, black, you know, two-ton iron clock sort of tilting to the left. And even though it looked like that, we still decided that it would be our insignia. Uh, our business cards have a little picture of it on the back. And, uh, you know, as you said, you know, people coming in, they're kind of wowed by the restoration. And the next question is, well, what are you doing with the clock? What are you doing with the clock? And uh, we've been talking about it for a really long time and just felt like we were always going to be 95% done until the, you know we were able to get the clock fully restored um it's been gone for a whole year and during the past year people have been like well what'd you do with the clock you know so it's been about the clock um <laughs> uh and uh you know just seeing it come back on i mean it is beautiful and the way it lights up i mean it's got this beautiful glow and, and now you know when we welcome guests at the hotel um we can just say hey you know take a left at the or you know depending on what kind of direction to come in at, at this gorgeous beautiful clock you know it's not something that we're going to ignore um it's something that we're certainly going to be very proud about um and you know we obviously like uh, jonathan said you know we did 25 years until we even have to put paint on it um we're just really really happy um it it really completes the the, the full project um you know and and you know sharing it with the community and being able to uh show our guests uh, you know sort of what uh what really great things can happen when, when people come together to, to restore something like this 
Fantastic. That's great. Um, <clears throat> and I do want to mention, um, we're getting some nice questions in um, from people watching out there, and I want to get to those now. Uh, but, um, you know, when you look around uh, the immediate neighborhood of the Francis, um, and then up and down Congress Street from, I'll say, Longfellow Square to Main Medical Center. Um, there's been so many exciting things happening in the past several years. Um, a number of years ago, um, uh, Peloton Labs uh, came in and brought a lot of people to work uh, at, at that co-working space. Tandem Bakery and Cafe has brought thousands and thousands of people uh, to the immediate neighborhood. Of course, Longfellow Square is full of restaurants and shops and their galleries, uh, many other projects. And, uh, you know, the owners of the Francis uh, have um, had great success and are involved in the development of uh, another uh, project across the street in what was a gas station and convenience store um, and currently has been the site of uh, a, a really important art installation uh, developed by our friends at Indigo Arts. And uh, there's been so much happening in, in the neighborhood. It's, it's very exciting to see. Um, I, we have some questions and uh, I'll also encourage our panelists to uh, jump in wherever they see fit. But let me ask one first, maybe Tim might want to take a, uh, a crack at this one. Um, by uh, Instagram, somebody asks, um, what are some of the other famous Seth Thomas clocks we might see around the country? Do any come to mind? Yeah, no, that's no problem. Um, so as it was mentioned in the video, um, there are somewhere between 70 and 80 of these types of clocks uh, ever built by Seth Thomas. And um, one of them is at the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors. So you can go to the museum in Columbia, Pennsylvania, and you'll see it standing. It looks uh, very much like this one, four-sided, uh, almost identical. And there, uh, they also have a movement in the museum running, so you can see that. Um, there's another one to be restored down at the American Watch uh, Clock Museum, uh, Clock Museum in Bristol, Connecticut, um, and that one, I, I, you know, being a national organization, we have access to all these other members, and so we've consulted with some of these people to, you know, understand what they're seeing, how they've fixed things in the past, get their expertise as well, and so uh, that one, I think, I'm waiting for that one to be dedicated. It should be up soon, but that one's in Bristol, Connecticut. So. Um, so there's a couple around on YouTube, you'll see a few privately owned as well. Um, so there are a few around, but again, uh, this one is kind of rare in that it uses an electric motor to lift the weights. And um, that that's unique uh, for this clock. But again, there are only between 70 and 80 of these ever made. So, uh, so that, um, you know, that's an interesting distinction. Um, you know, when people hear that there's electricity running to the clock, they wonder if it's an electric clock. Um, but then there's this pendulum and all these weights. And so um, it, it really is a mechanical movement, just um, has a very limited function, right, Tim, for that electric motor? Yes, that's correct, David. And and uh, in the history of this particular clock, the Hay and Peapotty clock, um, you know, it was originally, as you said, a mechanical clock with a motor lifting weights and the weights as they fall would power the clock. Um, so no electricity turning the, the hands or anything like that. At yeah. some point in its career, um, the gears were modified in that mechanical apparatus and an electrical electric motor uh, inserted in there to actually turn the hands. And so, uh, you know, one of our members, Mark, he, he had the job of trying to replicate those original shafts that the gears were on because they had been modified for this electric uh, motor. And so he had to try and recreate all that, which he did beautifully. And, um, you know, to get it back to its original uh, function, which is a mechanical clock, it's all gears. The pendulum is beating, uh, you know, uh, one, every, every one second. And that's what uh, keeps time and moves these gears. So it's all mechanical. So, now, Tim, you may have said this, but um, it, it, it's true. Uh, a couple of very famous or high profile Seth Thomas clocks um, it, uh, uh, the um, the clock at Grand Central Station in uh, New York City uh, is supposedly a Seth Thomas, as was the famous clock in the film High Noon. Uh, does that jive with your expert knowledge? 
It does. I don't know if I was around for high noon, but I have read that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, the oldest, uh, or certainly one of the oldest um, clock manufacturing companies in America going back to the early 1800s, right? Um, uh, here's a couple questions. So um, there's another question about other significant manual or mechanical clocks, not electric clocks in greater Portland, um, people might see and uh, any chance of a walking tour that might go to Sarah as well. Um, any, anybody know of other mechanical clocks of note in the Portland area? Uh, maybe I can help to get started and then maybe Sarah can help with the tour side. Um, yes, there are other mechanical clocks in Portland. Um, uh, the ones I'm aware of are tower clocks. Um, so I believe there's one in the North School at the end of, uh, over on the east end of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm pretty sure there are others. I just don't know where they are offhand, but it's a great idea. A tour of these would be welcome. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a clock in the Custom House, in the center of the Custom House down on uh, Commercial Street. It's uh, a beautiful mm -hmm. clock as well. So I'm sure there are more. I'm just not aware of them. Okay, I, Sarah, are you yeah. um, up for putting together a walking tour someday in the always, always. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that anyone's ever requested a walking tour of historic clocks, but, uh, but I think that would be super fun. And we actually do tours uh, during non non pandemic times um, of the customs house um, as well. So, um, so we we show off that clock quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great idea. We we are very lucky to have a very incredible um, army of, of docents that work with us at the Portland Observatory at the Customs House and, and our general walking tours. And um, they are uh, amazing researchers. And so I'm sure that we could um, we could pull something together. So it's on our, cool. consider it on our to-do list. Um, I've got a question from our good friend, Arthur Fink. Um, this one is um, uh, about, um, you know, the difference between an electric clock and a mechanical clock, obviously in this day and age, it's easier to have perfect time kept by an electric clock of some kind. But um, Arthur says there's something special and valuable about a clock whose very mechanism keeps the time. Can you talk about what he calls the spirituality of a clock? Tim, that's gotta be for you. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's a tough one to answer. Um, you know, I think for many of us that are part of the National Association, um, there is maybe a spiritual connection with clocks. We just, uh, we're addicted to them. We love to see the mechanical clocks. Uh, many of us work on them, um, you know, so there is a beauty to them. Um, the nice thing uh, for me personally about this clock is that the pendulum is so long. And as you know, as the pendulums get longer, they swing at a slower rate. Uh, or frequency. And um, this one is about every second. You know, the clocks we work at in our shop uh, beat a lot faster than that. Mm -hmm. You know, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, where this one is a nice mellow tick tock, tick tock. So, you know, there is some peace in that. I think just it's very, it's very, uh, uh, what I want to say, it, it's just really nice, serene to, to have that nice slow tick tock. <laughs> Very cool. That's a great question from Arthur. <clears throat> and um, he also asked one that I think goes to um, Jonathan. <clears throat> and uh, he says, it looks like with the rust and other corrosion, the clock casing lost much of its structural strength. You talked about that a little bit, uh, Jonathan. Um, how did you manage to augment that with what was left there um, and have it be historically accurate and, and, and stay strong? Well, most of the structural strength of the cast iron remained. Uh, the real place that was compromised, as I mentioned earlier, was that main bolt that went through the center of it. And that corroded section was literally cut out of the pipe and it was just a piece of commercial, you know, um, inch and a half pipe. Uh, so it was cut out and a new piece welded in. Um, and, you know, the, otherwise it was more surface uh, that had deteriorated rather than structure. Um, I want to answer a different question that you answered earlier about the interior of the clock, because 
the thing you don't think about is the surfaces of the castings on the inside. And the way the main globe was put together, they were like strips of, of metal that are screwed on and they weren't painted on the inside. They put the whole globe together before they painted it. And so when I went to remove those sections, there had been a lot of corrosion in there. So it was really important for me to make sure those surfaces got coated on the inside. So there, it would, if moisture got in there and there's a sealant in there, so it shouldn't, but if it does, it, those aren't gonna corrode anymore. Um, there's so many multiple fasteners that hold it to, together uh, that no one of them is, is critical, uh, except for that big bolt in the, in the center. <laughs> but one of my challenges was actually painting the insides of the columns and the inside of the little finial that fits on top and so forth, because there had been a lot of corrosion going on on the inside that you couldn't see on those unpainted surfaces. <laughs> So that was really uh, an important challenge for me to make sure both interior and exterior were, were coated. Fantastic. <clears throat> well, um, we really appreciate everybody's uh, contribution to this effort. Uh, not only those who are on the panel today, but their colleagues and so many in the community who were recognized in the video. Um, I'd like to bring us to a close in a, a, a couple of minutes here with um, just a quick round of um, comments from any or all of, of the panelists. Um, I, I'll, I'll just kind of start it by asking um, in just a word or two, um, what brings you the most joy in seeing this restoration completed? So what brings you the most joy in seeing this project done? And I'll, I'll see who jumps in first. Seeing uh, it done. <laughs> seeing it done. It's literally started in 2015 and it's 2020 and it's finally done. So that brings a lot of enjoyment. Seeing, seeing that clock, the finished, the finished product out there. Fantastic. And, and not seeing the, you know, the way it used to. <laughs> Who's well, next? I'll, I'll jump in next. Go ahead, Jonathan. It, you know, uh, it thrills me the way it looks, the final appearance uh, and its functionality are, are, are thrilling. And I also like, because of the coatings that I use, knowing that it's going to be that way for a long time. I, I won't be around the next time that it has to be worked on, at least for the, uh, the, the, the structural part. That's great. I'll jump yes, in. Um, I really, you know, I really enjoy sharing this, you know, sharing the story. It's, it sort of completes the story of you know, this five-year story of, of restoring the Francis and the property, but just being able to share, um, you know, this beautiful um, landmark with, with the city of Portland and, and everyone that, uh, that walks by and our guests and, and, you know, people who visit the neighborhood. And I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's really great to be able to do that. Wonderful. Sarah, any last thoughts? Sure. Well, I would just say it's, it's just a lovely bright spot on Congress Street. Um, it's, it's, um, it's such a community landmark, like you said, and um, I think, you know, everyone, um, it's just a really nice way to, to, uh, to draw you into that area, that part of Congress Street, and, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's just a treat, I think, so. Thank you guys again for all, uh -huh. of, your, That's great. all of your efforts. Yeah. For me, it's um, really a lot about pride in Portland and pride in Maine and uh, the incredible collaboration uh, on a project like this. And of course, there are so many wonderful projects in Portland that only happen because of generosity and collaboration. So I'd like to thank everybody again uh, who played a role in uh, either inspiring this, uh, helping with information, resources, uh, neighbors, business leaders, um, historic preservation staff at the city of Portland, Greater Portland Landmarks, and uh, so many people who contributed time, talent, and I guess more than anything, inspiration to get it done. So I wanna thank everybody. One more thank you to uh, Avenue Media for producing today's event. Uh, we're so thrilled that people joined us. Uh, we would like to have had this in person, but uh, we reached out to perhaps a lot more people 
uh, using uh, media this way. So um, we'll sign off here, but make sure you come visit the clock. Uh, listen carefully for that slow tick tock and think about the heart that's beating inside that clock. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, David. Have a great day.